as I mentioned um, last time, you know, this area is changing all the time. There's a lot of research going into this field. So I wanted to kind of pull together um, the latest and share with you. And of course, bring in our Islamic tradition because so many times, you know, as I, you know, I'm reading this information, I'm like, this is totally in our deen. Like, this is what we're supposed to be doing. So again, not that we need science to validate that, but it just really helps to solidify that. So today's session is going to focus on, I call it inflammaging, inflammation. Um, and last session, we talked about the gut microbiome, as um, Osada Fadwa just mentioned. And um, a really big part of the gut, gut microbiome is it does affect inflammation in our body. And on the flip side, inflammation can actually affect our gut microbiome. So they're kind of hand in hand, they work together. And they both subjects in and of themselves are just vast and just a lot of information. So I felt like I have to do um, two parts. And even then, when I do two parts, I'm like, there's just so much to talk about. So this is a long session. So, you know, feel free, everyone, to get up, take some breaks, stretch. Um, you know, if you want to have other family members listen, no problem. This is not a sisters only um, session. So feel free to do that. Um, and I do have my email listed here. So if anyone has questions, you're welcome to directly email me. And I am kind of curious to see, I can I was actually mentioning this to Salah Fadwa that, you know, it would be, I, I'm down to do maybe some sort of like a support group type of class or like a smaller session for those who are trying to get healthier, that are maybe trying to manage their weight or, you know, anything else um, health related. So if that sounds like something interesting to you, then, you know, email me, let me know or reach out to me. I know many of you know me directly, so feel free to let me know and then we can see what we can do from there. All right. So a breakdown of what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to be talking about, okay, what is inflammation? What causes it? Risk factors? How it affects our body? And most importantly, what we can do. So as I mentioned in the previous session, I really like to get into the science of this, not to freak people out or not to, you know, get people confused, but more so we know kind of what's going on in our body. So this could be used as a tool of motivation that, you know what, if I eat this, if I do this, this is going to increase my inflammation because of X, Y, Z. So maybe I need to think twice. So again, this isn't meant to be overwhelming. It's just meant to, again, give us some background information. Um, if you have questions, I'm going to be hopefully um, going to be gauging the time and watching my time so that at the end of this session, I do have time to um, ask or answer questions. So if you have questions as you are you know, going through this, you know, jot them down separately. And then at the end, we can kind of um, you know, um, answer those in the chat box. Um, so in any case, this particular topic of inflammation, a lot of people are dealing with it and don't even know about it, right? It's just a part of aging, right? And a, a good friend once, she mentioned something to me. She's like, you know, I don't feel like I have extra weight. I, I just feel puffy. And that is a really accurate way to sometimes describe how inflammation is feeling in the body. Right? And then that just got me thinking, you know, and I started really looking into inflammation more at that point that this is really affecting us on so many levels. So first things first, what exactly is inflammation? So this is actually a good thing. We need inflammation. This is actually our body's first line of defense and first step of healing, right? So what happens in inflammation is this is activating our immune cells in our body in response to infection or damage to tissue. So there are some really cute um, TED Ed talks on YouTube that you guys can access. And there's one in particular, and maybe we can um, send a link later, um, that talks about the immune system. And when I think about the immune system, I literally think of the military. Like we have a military 
in our body. And all these cells have different roles that they are playing, right? There are certain cells that are literally scouting our body, looking for toxins and other foreign particles. If they find them, they'll activate different signals. Other cells will rush in. There are particular cells called the macrophages that will literally like engulf the cell and like eat it and disintegrate it, right? Other cells come in to kind of like, you know, quote unquote, clean up the mess after the aftermath, right? So this is a very highly tuned system in our body. And right now we're in the midst of this pandemic. I know things are opening up, but we're still in the midst of this pandemic. So we're very concerned, I know, about our immunity. And we really want to make sure our immune, cells, our immune cells are working at their optimal, right? So we'll be talking about, again, that kind of as, that's kind of the, the, the whole premise of this entire series is that if we work on our gut microbiome, we get those inflammation levels down, it's going to help boost and strengthen our immunity. So going back to inflammation. So when there is some sort of infection, some sort of damage to the cells, Signals are given out and the immune cells rush over there. And we'll come back to that. And this is a very, very complicated process. So inflammation, this is literally interacting with every other system in our body, especially the nervous system. Now, historically, inflammation was in response to threats, like injury. Okay, I got cut, I got scrape, right? I got a bug bite or whatever. Um, infection. Right? It was short term, right? We got injured, our body kicked in, inflammation levels increased, immune system um, kicked into play, right? We healed, we took care of that you know, foreign particle, and we're back to baseline. But nowadays, inflammation is chronically activated, right? So for some people, it just doesn't turn off. And this can be due to a lot of different things, but it's our modern lifestyle, the threats. And these can even be psychosocial threats, our perception, right? Our thoughts, right? So this can activate the inflammatory response. And if the inflammatory response keeps getting activated over and over and over and over, I wouldn't say there's exactly like a malfunction, but it definitely is affected. And this could be the root of many diseases. Now there's two different types of inflammation. Okay, so acute inflammation, this is short term, this is normal, right? This is just, you know, some sort of a physiological response. It clears up within minutes to days, maybe a few weeks. And it's a response to injury, irritation, infection, right? So it's short term. But chronic inflammation, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today, this is more of a long-term physiological response. It can last months to years. And this can be due to many different factors, right? Poor nutrition. This is a huge one, right? I am a dietitian, so I'm, of course, going to be focusing a lot on nutrition, but it doesn't just stop there, you guys. It's also stress, right? This is a huge Huge part of inflammation is stress. So we'll come back to that. Environmental toxins. And this is an area that is relatively newish. And I'm not going to be able to get into it that much. Maybe I'll have a separate, you know, toxins class. Who knows? Stay tuned. We'll see. But environmental toxins. Endocrine disruptors. There are certain toxins that can get into our body that act like hormones, right? And those can literally wreak havoc in our body. For example, in the pla in plastics, the BPA, right? So I know a lot of plastics now are BPA-free. BPA was actually an endocrine a disruptor, right? It was messing with our hormones. It was affecting our hormones, right, in a negative way. So this is a really big area that we don't know the long-term effects. Pesticides that are being sprayed on our foods, right? Think about right now, all the disinfectant use, right? I know, um, you know a lot of us are taking a lot of measures. We don't want to get ill because we don't know what the situation is with the coronavirus, right? But are we being too clean? I must say, don't be clean right now. Obviously, be clean. <laughs> but like, what are going to be the long-term repercussions of this? We will see, 
right? What are some of the cleaning products we're using? I remember when this whole pandemic started and everyone was kind of stockpiling. I remember going on walmart.com and I like ordered all this like cleaning agents, whatever was available, stuff that I don't normally even use. And I remember when it came and I kind of use a little bit, I'm like, the smell, like I could feel it just getting into my lungs. I'm like, what is this stuff? And when I looked at the ingredients, it was scary, you know? So all that stuff. Also, additives and preservatives. How is that affecting us? How is that accumulating in our body, right? Metals, right? A lot of us actually have very high metal levels in our body, right? So that can really affect us, right? And metal and all these different toxins, they actually get stored with fat. And what's really interesting is that when a, as a person starts to lose weight, some of those toxins start getting released into the body, right? So that's something that's interesting that's going on. What are the repercussions of that? We don't know, right? So that's definitely an area to, to look at. I remember um, last year or the year before, I had attended this really in-depth you know, toxin seminar. And after the seminar was over, I was like, oh my gosh, like we're surrounded. <laughs> like it felt overwhelming. And I felt like I'm like, okay, now I'm feeling stressed about this. I need to relax. So there needs to be a balance. Okay. I'm not, I don't want anyone to feel stressed hearing this stuff because of course, and that's going to backfire, but I just want us to be aware and try to make some smart choices, right? Look at the ingredients of things, right? Ask ourselves, what are we using? Do we need this? Right? Moving on. Also microbial or viral infection can affect chronic inflammation levels. Right. So for instance, you know, and I think I mentioned this um, in the previous session, right? Let's suppose we ate something and we got food poisoning or something, right? That bacteria or microbe could get into our body, right? And it can proliferate and we could feel effects from it years later, right? And that's actually an area that people are looking at in terms of irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, which is becoming very common. And irritable bowel syndrome is actually also very related, intertwined with stress levels. So, you know, researchers are looking at that, you know, some sort of a bacteria or virus or something can maybe even instigate something like IBS and other inflammatory bowel diseases. Right? So again, you know, we're doing our best and, you know, we just, again, have to be um, cognizant of, of, of what are some of our practices are in terms of reducing our microbial or viral infections, um, you know, making sure that, you know, we're uh, following, you know, um, food storage practices, you know, so for instance, if you have something, you know, try to refrigerate things, you know, don't leave stuff just on the counter. Oh, it's good. It's not, you know, hot outside. There's something called a danger zone. The danger zone is between 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when bacteria tend to proliferate. So if you have stuff sitting out, right, for a long period of time, I was remembering in college, like we would just leave stuff on the, on the, on the stove and then the next morning we're like, oh, hey, the lasagna is still out. All right, let's eat it. So like, you know, think of all the bacteria proliferating in there, right? So things like that, you know, making sure that we're not leaving, have leftovers for a long period of time, right? Um, so again, I know there's a balance. We want some, you know, uh, microbes, of course, but we also have to be smart too. Also chronic inflammation is just part of aging. That's why I call this session inflammaging actually, because as we're aging, all the metabolic processes that are taking place in our body and have been taking place since birth, they create byproducts, right? Things like free radicals, free radicals are cells that are unstable. And they're just kind of roaming around the body, right? Um, so there's a lot of other things that start proliferating. Uh, this is my, I think this is my word for today, proliferation. <laughs> I'm using it a lot. But there's a lot of these um, processes, right, that are going on in our body that are creating these byproducts, you know, that are affecting us. So we're kind of like Tin Man, right? Think of, you know, Wizard of Oz, Tin Man, right? We kind of are rusting inside. We may feel 20, <laughs> but that's not quite the case internally. Sorry to break the news. So let's talk about the signs of acute inflammation. Again, these are, you know, this is a short-term um, 
situation in the body. And there's five classical signs of inflammation, pain, heat, redness, swelling, and sometimes even loss of function. I remember last year or the year before I had gotten this spider bite or bug bite. I don't know what this was. It was huge, huge, massive on my leg. It was like purple and it was like just scary looking and everyone in my department were like, you got to go get this checked out. And I was just like, and I actually started thinking about inflammation. I'm like, wow, this is inflammation taking effect in my body right now because this is feeling very hot. There's swelling, there's redness. So, you know, like this happened. We've all experienced this in some way, right? Usually from injury. So what happens in the short-term inflammatory um, process is let's suppose we get some sort of an injury. So in this case, like a splinter, it breaks through the skin, right? And the tissues um, where it breaks through, there's little particles that can start to uh, rush out, right? And these are called, these are chemical signals, right? And some of these chemical signals are called cytokines. And we'll come and talk about them a little bit later on. But these cytokines, they start to send out signals. Hey, body, we're injured. Help. Right? So the immune system's like, wait, we're on it. We're on it. So the immune system kicks in, right? So these macrophages, these are cells that literally will eat whatever, you know, if there was some sort of like a toxin here or something that's not supposed to belong there, it'll come and eat that. Um, there are phagocytic cells that are in our bloodstream. They'll rush over into that area. That's why we see swelling. And the reason for swelling and this fluid accumulation is because the body is trying to contain, right? It's trying to contain that area. It doesn't want it to spread. So when we see swelling and fluid accumulation, that's again a way for our body to protect ourselves. So all these cells now are kicking in, they're going out, right? They're like, so then they will surround that area, try to reduce infection, and then eventually our body will heal itself. So this is the, again, acute inflammation. So cells signal alarm, blood flow increases, these inflammatory mediators, these are cells that, again, will rush in their immune cells. They'll kill a bacteria or other particle. They're going to remove the damaged tissue, the debris, and then there's resolution, and we're good to go. And even in acute inflammation, we have two different types. So there's something called innate. So this is just a natural first-line defense. So anything that seems like a threat gets this response. So again, the immune cells will rush in there, take care of whatever it is. Now, there's something called adaptive or acquired response. And the reason I'm gonna be talking about this is because, hello, we're in the age of you know, COVID-19, coronavirus. And this is where the immune cells, they will remember some sort of a foreign agent. Like, hey, we know you. We have these antigens that are produced. They're kind of, will, then the cells will remember. Right. And again, I'm not getting into the whole nitty gritty of like, you know, T cells and killer cells and B cells and lymphocytes. I'm not going to get into any of that, but just know it's a very elaborate system that kicks into play here. Right. And the adaptive or acquired system, this occurs when the innate immunity fails. So if let's suppose we're not able to combat the infection or injury, then these more highly skilled cells will kick in and they will remember. We've seen you before, and we're going to take care of this. Okay. So if both of these systems are not effective, if for some reason they're not working, then this is where prolonged inflammation can result. Also, if we have high levels of constant inflammation, Right? Sometimes this can even trigger an autoimmune disease. And autoimmune diseases are basically where the body is fighting itself. It's attacking itself. So for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, right? Very common one that we usually think about. Hashimoto's. This is another one that's becoming very common. Hashimoto's is basically where the body is att attacking the thyroid. And the thyroid, this is where a lot of our um, energy metabolism is based, right? So when people have thyroid issues, and we're seeing this more, it's, it's on the rise. I can't tell you how many of my patients have underlying thyroid issues that sometimes are not caught. Um, 
by you know conventional labs um and it's because of that that they're not able to lose the weight right or they're struggling with weight or whatnot um so am i saying that if we have high levels of inflammation we're definitely going to get an autoimmune disease no i'm not saying that but i'm just saying that is something that is definitely a big hypothesis and a, definitely a theory that we are seeing come to life now these cytokines these are the chemical signals right little small peptides and they're like little signaling systems that affect um, a lot of biological processes so these are the signs that our body is giving out something's wrong help us help us help us right so this is facilitating communication between the innate and adaptive immune systems. And there can be cytokines that are pro-inflammatory, right? Which again, in short term is a good thing. We want pro-inflammation to happen, to heal ourselves, right? And these are released in defensively in response to trauma and infection. Then we have anti-inflammatory cytokines. These are cytokines that'll kick in that, okay, good, we're good, everyone, we're good. Let's promote healing now. But if we have too much pro-inflammatory cytokines, they're constantly calling the immune system, help us, help us, help us, help us. Then this becomes very taxing on the body. The body's like, okay, I gotta go here. Something's wrong there. Now I gotta go there. Something's wrong there. And this is precisely why we see increased risk of so many diseases. This is precisely why we see an issue with weight gain and why it makes it very difficult for some people to lose weight because our body is in this constant pro inflammatory, chronic inflammatory mode. So short term, historically, physical stress, injury, infection, hunger, thirst, heat, cold, we had like very short term things, right? We lived in societies that were close knit. Everyone knew everyone's business, right? right? And there was, and we're going to come, we're going to talk about this later on. Right, so historically, usually the physical stress was what was affecting our bodies. But nowadays, it's more psychosocial stress. A lack of predictability, lack of sense of control, lack of social support, right? Think about our communities now, even more so now that we're like, you know, sheltering in place, we're not able to connect. And again, this is gonna come up later on. This can be a source of inflammation in the body. So our body is really shifting So a quick review, so acute inflammation, short-term inflammation is good, right? There's some serious threat that tr gets triggered. The triggers inflammation, cut, bruise, infection, body releases these inflammatory compounds, the job gets done, anti-inflammatory compounds are released, and everything's back to business as usual. But with chronic or bad inflammation, some sort of non-serious event, eating a certain food, right? Bacteria, toxins, psychosocial issues can trigger the inflammation. The body releases these inflammatory compounds, but something happens and the body doesn't release the anti-inflammatory compound. So we keep getting this inflammatory system response because this is happening all the time, right? Some of us are always stressed, right? How many of us are not stressed? Exactly. I had a patient yesterday though. She was like, I'm like, do you have any stress? She was like, no. I'm like, whoa, okay. Like one person in like a long time I've met. But then it turns out it was her perception of stress. She did have stress. She's telling me about her life. And I'm like, wow, that sounds stressful to me. But the way she was viewing it, she didn't view it like that. So perception is very key as well. So acute inflammation, again, caused by short-term matters chronic inflammation can lead to long-term issues. So chronic inflammation, you guys, again, inflammation is termed up, turned up too high, it lingers for too long. The immune system continues to pump out these white blood cells and chemical messengers. The body feels like it's under consistent and constant attack. So the immune system keeps fighting constantly, indefinitely. These white blood cells that we have, they might even end up attacking nearby healthy tissues and organs. We're learning this about fat cells. Fat cells, you guys, aren't just lying around like little blobs. They are very active cells. They're spewing out a lot of inflammatory chemicals, hormones, that can really, again, affect us on so many levels. 
And the thing with fat cells is, you guys, is that as we gain weight, so we're born with a certain amount of fat cells. And as we gain weight, right, and we gain fat, the fat cells start to increase in size. And then guess what, guys? They break off and a new fat cell is created. So now we have double. And the more this happens, the more fat cells are created. And then if a person loses weight, guess what happens? The fat cells, they shrink, but guess what? They don't go away. They're there, ready to fill up very easily. So that's why, again, with the weight, right, for, for many people, it's very easy to gain that weight again. So let's talk about the potential symptoms. Okay, so that was the science, see like kind of the mechanism, what's going on. Sorry, I didn't mean that to be for that to be overwhelming, but just kind of again laying the foundation here so we understand what our body is dealing with and what's actually happening. So some symptoms of inflammation, body pain, chronic fatigue, insomnia, depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. We talked about this last session with the gut microbiome, right? That about 90, 95% of serotonin, one of the feel-good neurotransmitters, serotonin, GABA, dopamine, are actually based in our gut, right? So if our gut's off, then we're off, right? And thus, again, when our gut's off, this also can be very inflammatory for the body. So depression, anxiety, mood disorders, gastrointestinal complications, constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux can also be due to inflammation. Weight gain or weight loss. Frequent infections. Not on the slide, but also we see this a lot. Brain fog, right? Lack of concentration. Right? All of these things could be potentially due to this chronic inflammation. Now, how do I know if I have chronic inflammation? I think deep down, honestly, if we ask ourselves, we kind of know. Okay. But there are lab um, that we can see this. Um, some of the conventional doctors may not do this. This is becoming a little bit more common, but maybe not as common as we'd like to see. Um, but one of the markers is called uh, CRP, high, sensitivity, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So this is one of the inflammatory markers. Um, but the thing with C-reactive protein, it can also be elevated in acute inflammation. So let's suppose you, know, you have some sort of a, a virus or something that you're kind of getting over. Um, so we might see high levels just from that, right? Um, so normal for women is usually less than one milligrams per liter. For men, less than 0.55. Um, so again, this is a test that you can ask your doctor to do, but I'm going to be honest, you guys, you know, if you have a functional medicine practitioner in your area and you can look this up online, just functional practitioner in my area, there are a lot now, right? That, um, kind of deal with medicine in this more holistic light. And a lot of them will do very in-depth tests to see, you know, what, the inflammation levels are, and things that could potentially be affecting it, right? If you have metal and toxic buildup in your body, right? Food sensitivities, right? That's another one. And, and I mentioned that in the, in the previous session, there are tests to, to see what foods you're, you're sensitive to. And again, you know, it's hit or miss with some of these tests because maybe the test turns out that you are sensitive because you're eating a lot of that. I kind of gave last time my example of, you know, when I was eating a lot of eggs and almonds. Those were the two things I was very sensitive to. And I was kind of like, what? Um, but so again, it might be due to that or it might be due to a true sensitivity. So one thing that I want us to really do, everyone, is to keep a food journal. Right. So it can be and I don't really like the online ones. I mean, you could do the online ones. But I just want to use it in terms of us figuring out what am I eating? How am I feeling? Right? So do I have brain fog? Do I feel like I just crashed? Right? Bloating. Irritability. Right? Cravings. 
So keep track. So if you're like, I can't write stuff down, it's too hard. Okay, then take pictures. We're doing that a lot of times anyways. Just take a picture of what you're eating that day before you put it into your mouth. And then at the end of the day, kind of do an audit. Like, how did I feel? What was going on today? Right? And, you know, mark it on a calendar. I like to use, you know, the big calendars. You can get those planners. And write down there, really fatigued. Right? Really bloated. Or flip side, really good. I feel excellent. I feel energized. And see what you ate. Also, what are your, what's your sleep like that day? What was your stress levels like that day? Right? For women, right? Their cycle. Where are you in the cycle? Right? So this is really valuable information, you know, when you are taking this information to a practitioner so they can kind of look at, you can look at this too and see is there some sort of a common denominator? right? Every time I eat this, I feel like this. So maybe I shouldn't eat that, right? If I push myself too much, I know I'm going to get inflamed and like, you know, just uh, messed up the next day. So then maybe I shouldn't push myself. So we need to know what our triggers are. And I think a lot of us do, but we tend to kind of ignore it, but it make, and it can make the, pro the whole problem worse. So chronic inflammation, it's not just, you know, the previous symptoms of, you know, fatigue and bloating and brain fog, it can actually contribute to long-term diseases, right? So not just pain and chronic pain and mood disorders, but cognitive impairment, the metabolic syndrome, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are really looking at into. Um, cardiovas cardiovascular disease, by the way, is actually an inflammatory disease because what happens is with cardiovascular disease, when we are producing too much bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, like we do need some cholesterol. We never want to be cholesterol free. We never want to see zero on our cholesterol levels because then we'll be dead, to be honest, because we need cholesterol. Cholesterol is a component of our cell membranes. Cholesterol is a component of our hormones, right? It's a component of bile, which breaks down fat. So we need cholesterol. Our liver makes cholesterol because it doesn't trust us to eat it. So we're making cholesterol in our body. We need that. And cholesterol is made, the raw material for cholesterol is actually saturated fat. And saturated fat can come from animal products. Saturated fats can come from tropical oils, uh, coconut oil, um, palm kernel oil, cocoa butter. And uh, nuts have some a uh, little bit of saturated fat in there as well. Right, so when we have too much saturated fat, too much trans fat, trans fat is this man-made fat that used to be in a lot of processed goods, but they've luckily banned that, but it's still lurking out there. So when we have too much trans fat, too much saturated fat, it causes our liver to overmake LDL, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. And then this starts to get out into the body. And if it oxidizes, right, it becomes kind of unstable. And if this LDL goes along and gets nice and snug against the arterial walls, right? It'll just go and kind of lodge itself there. If our arteries are weak for whatever reason, we have high blood pressure, high blood glucose, um, smokers, so on and so forth. So in any case, if it gets snug against the walls of the arteries, the body's like, whoa, whoa, something's here and this is not supposed to be here. Immune system kicks in. We're in. Right? They'll rush over there to this LDL, it's oxidized LDL, they'll surround it, they'll engulf it, and they'll create a little cap over it. And the more and more that this happens, this is that plaque buildup, right? And it hardens the arteries and then leads to cardiovascular disease. So it actually starts as an inflammatory process where the body's like, wait, this thing is not supposed to be here. Autoimmune diseases can also be triggered, as I mentioned earlier, with chronic inflammation. Even our dental health is very closely intertwined, right? And then I have autoimmune diseases there again. I don't know, because it's really important. I don't know. It's just there. Sorry. <laughs> um, but in any case, so as you can see, and not included on here, but something that is being looked into is can it even trigger cancers? right? Tr cancer is on the rise. We hear about someone getting cancer all the time. At age, it doesn't even matter anymore. So how does one get inflamed? I know some of you are listening to this and feeling inflamed, so don't, you guys, relax. It's okay. Let's break this down. How does one get inflamed? So some potential causes, 
of inflammation. So if our body cannot eliminate an agent, so this causes an acute inflammation response. Let's suppose we have some bacteria, we got some E. coli, we ate some bad burger or something, um, some parasites, right? Which can happen. And if these get into our body and our body's not able to eliminate this, this can trigger a long-term inflammatory response. Exposure to a low level particular irritant or foreign material that can't be eliminated. So let's suppose you're exposed to industrial chemicals. Let's suppose you're in an old building that has asbestos, right? So they could be even low level irritants and toxins that you are being exposed to on a regular basis. You know, let's suppose, you know, you have a lot of cleaning products in your house or, you know, you, you know, um, or in a job that involves you being around a lot of toxins, right? So you have low level exposure that can trigger this inflammatory response, right? Autoimmune disorders, um, some sort of a defect in cells. So let's suppose the cell is supposed to mediate the inflammatory response, but there's something wrong with the cell, they can't do it. Um, so that can trigger the long-term inflammation. If we keep having episodes of acute inflammation, I get injured, then this happens to me. Right, I got um, some sort of, a, again, that particular irritant that I'm being exposed to. So if we have constant episodes of acute inflammation, this can then trigger this long-term um, inflammatory response. Also inflammatory and biochemical inducers that can cause oxidative stress. Mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondria, going back to junior high science class, guys. So the mitochondria is like the powerhouse of the cell. There's some sort of a dysfunction in the mitochondria, right? This can increase production of something called free radicals, right? So free radicals are crazy cells, I like to call them, they're just kind of out of control. They're unstable. They're usually mix, missing some sort of an oxygen. And this is where antioxidants come into play. Antioxidants are cells um, in fruits, vegetables, you know, usually plant-based foods that will come and they'll be like, hey, calm down, free radical. I have an atom to donate to you. Right, so that's why we really want to make sure we're getting lots of antioxidants to calm these free radicals down. Advanced glycation end products, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, this can be triggered from foods we eat, uric acid crystals. Um, and you know anyone that's ever had gout? It's due to that. Um, oxidized lipoprotein, which I'm going to talk about momentarily as, momentarily as well. This can be caused by fats, deep frying foods, for example. Homocysteine and others. What are some other risk factors associated with chronic inflammation? Age, right? I mentioned this earlier. As we're getting older, guys, we're just rusting inside. We have all these metabolic processes that are occurring, right? So our body, things that we did younger, they do catch up with us, right? I always mention this in, in some of my classes that I teach with um, teens and young adults. I'm like, you know, things, you know, yeah, you know, you can eat that burger and fries and all this other stuff and feel fine but later on it does catch up with us right so age as we age our inflammatory levels do go up obesity because again we have a high levels of fat cells visceral fat visceral fat is that fat that's around our abdominal area that deep belly fat right and it's a very active fat it's spewing out right, inflammatory components, hormones, right? And this can trigger a lot of different issues in the body. If we get fat and if it gets into our cells, it can actually mess with the signaling of the cells and then cause insulin resistance. If we have insulin resistance, this leads to prediabetes and diabetes. Diet, very closely intertwined with infl inflammation because there are a lot of inflammatory foods that we eat. Smoking is very inflammatory for the body. If we have um, low testosterone or estrogen, right, that can also affect inflammation levels and then stress and sleep disorders. So let's talk about stress. And I don't think we realize how much stress is actually affecting us, right? I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hands, but how many people with this? Um, you know, pandemic have gained a lot of weight, right? Because of the stress eating, just like this response that, okay, I'm stressed out and I need food. And I always joke about this, 
that we're not usually craving vegetables, right? I'm still waiting for someone to tell me that. I'm still waiting for someone to tell me I get stressed out and I eat salad, right? It says no one ever, right? It's usually fats, sugars, right? Because our body's craving that. So cortisol, this hormone really affects us. It, again, also wreaks havoc because this is the hormone that is released as part of the stress response, right? Because our body, when we're stressed, again, it shifts into preservation mode. Something is wrong. we got to save ourselves. I think we're in famine. Okay, so hold on to the fat and the calories because we might need that, right? So when we're stressed, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. Right? Our eyes dilate. Our blood pressure goes up. Right? Heart rate increases. Respiration increases, right? We're like, half-heartedly, I guess you can say, digesting because we're like, you know, I can't expend too much time digesting because I got to run out of here. Something's wrong. So glucose and fats are dumped into the bloodstream, right? Our eyes are dilated. Hearing becomes acute, right? So again, we're redirecting energy from non-essential functions. The immune system actually is actually temporarily suppressed by cortisol. So this is why when people are stressed, it's hard for them to fight off diseases. Right? I remember in college, like for four years, every June, every June without fail, I finished finals and bam, I always had laryngitis. Four years straight. Because right? high stress levels, immune systems, of course, affected and bam, it hit me. And a lot of people feel like this. You are preparing for an event. Something's going on. Stress levels are going high. The event's over and bam, the next day I am wiped out. Right, so this is kind of what's going on. So in the short-term world, the threat is resolved within 20 to 60 minutes, we're good, we're back to baseline. But what if we're constantly feeling like this? We're at work, stress there, we come home, stress here, stress, 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 turn on the news, oh my gosh. Stress, 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 right? A perception of stress also. We have to look at stress as a challenge not a threat because when we look at it as a threat our body goes into preservation mode but if we're looking at it as a challenge we rise to the equation there's a really good um, ted talk where uh, one of the researchers actually talks about this where stress can be positive right and again it's hard we really have to work on this i know for myself personally i literally have been doing this um for a while i'm like this is not a threat this is a challenge Traffic, no worries, challenge, you know? So it's like, I'm literally telling myself this as like a mantra, you know? So I don't shift into that panic mode because when we're in that panic mode, look at what happens. And if this is constantly happening every day, every day, every day, this is dramatically affecting and increasing the inflammation levels because the body thinks something's wrong. So these unmet challenges, especially chronic ones, can dysregulate the cortisol system. And this chronic stress can also contribute to insulin resistance, as I was mentioning earlier. It's like affecting the signaling of the cells. The stress can lead to craving pro-inflammatory foods. So the foods we're eating when we're stressed are adding to the inflammation. So it's just this cycle. The adrenal uh, complex goes into overdrive. I'm not gonna get into that. That's a whole other world right there. Um, we go into this hypercortisol state immune cells start to dysfunction. We have something called glucocorticoids on our immune cells and they start to ignore cortisol because there's so much of it. They're like, there's just so much of you. So they go rogue and then they start to become chronically activated. So we have these chronically activated immune cells just all over our body. Visceral and abdominal obesity starts to set in. And then there's a dysbiosis imbalance in the gut microbiome. And that also is a huge, huge issue as we talked about last time. Inflammation can affect our brain. We have some neurons that have these cytokine, cytokine receptors that can circulate in the brain, that can interact with the brain tissues. The immune cells can actually flip to a pro-inflammatory state. So the brain is actually very vulnerable to chronic stress and low-grade inflammation. So we're not sleeping enough when we're stressed, right? Sleep, you guys, is a time of detox for the body. Right? Our bodies are clearing out the brain when we're sleeping. We're consolidating memories. If we have high amounts of cortisol, 
right? It's affecting our brain cells. It can kill off brain cells. That's why people, when they're really highly stressed, can't remember things. They're highly irritable, right? Also, the stressed brain is causing inflammation. And this can affect synthesis, release, or re reuptake of dopamine, serotonin, these mood um, neurotransmitters. It affects learning and memory. It can affect motivation, right? Anxiety and alarm. There's research looking at inflammation in the brain as a way of affecting depression. So we have these increased circulating cytokines. So we see oxidative stress in the brain. This neuroinflammation can be associated with reoccurrent depression. Also, this inflammation can be due to early childhood adverse adversity. And there are um, little quizzes and things. There's been studies called the ACE study um, online. And that's a whole other area. Again, it's kind of beyond this presentation. But think of childhood, right? So if there was severe, prolonged, or repetitive adversity with a lack of necessary nurturance or support of a caregiver, so let's suppose a child doesn't have someone to say, it's okay, give them a hug, nurture them, ha ha show them even what a positive stress response is, right? So children can go into this prolonged cortisol activation, this inflammatory state. The body can fail to normalize these changes after the stressor is removed. So we're seeing how even childhood trauma can contribute to a pro-inflammatory state and therefore risk for disease even in adulthood. Right? It's deep. If you think about it, our perception of things, right? We learn from what we saw, not what we were told, right? What we saw. So how did your parents respond to stress or your caregiver? Because that's usually how you're responding to stress. Did you see your mom turn to food? Right? Do people hold things in and not let them out? Just get over it. So right, whatever, move on. And inside you're just festering, right? Because that's inflammatory to the body. So we really need to be careful because kids are looking at us. I remember some years ago when my cousins, her little daughter, four years old, I remember we were in line or um, at, a, at, a, at a party, a um, little buffet line. So she was in front of me and she was four. And I was like, oh, you want me to help you, you know, get your chicken and rice and whatever? She's like, no, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to get fat. I'm like, you're four and you're skinny. <laughs> so I like went to my cousin. I'm like, your daughter just told me she didn't want to eat chicken because she didn't get fat. Well, what's going on there? Because my cousin, I remember, was like actively dieting. She's always doing some sort of a diet. So this child saw her and just, right, their sponges took that in, right? How does that affect one's relationship with food? later on in life, right? Using food as a reward. I always tell parents, uh, my patients and stuff, like, don't do that. You don't associate food with reward. Oh, you did good. Let's go have ice cream. You did bad. You're not having ice cream. Then like people then start to turn to food as comfort or reward, right? And a lot of times those foods aren't exactly good for us. Right? So it's really deep when you start digging into it and looking into you know, what we learned as child, even our perception of things. I know so many people, oh, I can't be plant-based because if I don't eat meat, I'm going to be weak. And I'm like, no, you don't have to eat so much meat. It's okay. Our ancestors actually didn't eat so much meat. No, 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 I can't because I'm going to be weak and I'm going to need iron. And I'm like, it's only one meal because of that perception again as a child that I got to have meat. So we got to dig deep. And that's why, you know, I mentioned earlier on, I actually am thinking of doing like a series for those that are interested, a little support group to really dig deep and to look at what our habits are, right? In terms of how are we viewing food and other lifestyle things, right? How is my response to stress? Loneliness, huge, huge, huge area. A big, and right now I'm going through factors that can affect our inflammation levels. So loneliness, social connection may be a biological need vital to physical well-being. 
right? I think what I'm going to do is just like have a list of different TED Talks I like, and then maybe just send it out to everyone. But there's a really excellent TED Talk that looks at, it's like a, there's this long-term study that's been going on since like the 30s. Um, they were looking at Harvard men and men in the Boston area, and they've been kind of following them throughout, you know, these decades. And the study kind of evolved in different ways. You know, I'd like to look at, you know, success, and then it kind of evolved to look at, okay, what factors affect these people's health? And a huge factor that affects our longevity is social connection, right? You don't need to have a thousand friends, okay? I know people have a thousand, you know, friends on Instagram and this and that. No, those aren't real friends, right? Let's be honest. But true people that you can turn to at 2 a.m., right? Someone that you can, you know, vent to, that you know would be there. It doesn't have to be a lot of people, right? So, you know, I was talking about this earlier. In olden times, you know, we were very close-knit communities. Everyone was in everyone's business, good and bad, right? But we had that connection, right? Where you see people, you're around people, and look at us now. Hey, look at us right now. We're in a virtual world, right? So this is the thing. This is a huge driver of inflammation, Loneliness increases inflammation. It's stressful for the body. And inflammation increases loneliness. Because when we're inflamed and not feeling good, do you want to talk to someone? Do you want to go out and do, I know right now we can't, but still, do you want to reach out? Do you want to do those things? Right? Because you're irritable, you're mad, you're whatever. So it's like this two-way street. Loneliness is more dangerous than obesity. And is as damaging to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, I don't know who counted that. Let's count 15 cigarettes and loneliness here. <laughs> like, I can't tell. But in terms of the weightiness of this, think about this, you guys. Right? Think of this over the years. I know many of us, we grew up before social media. And look at children now. Do they know how to, like, act with other people? Like, seriously. And then think of our seniors. 43% of seniors feel lonely on a regular basis. I know this number has gone up. Right? When this whole pandemic started, someone was telling me they had gone to Costco and they saw an elderly man. And you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was like losing it. <laughs> and so there was this old man there. And people were like, what are you doing here, sir? Like, this is dangerous. He's like, I'm just so lonely. I just need to be out with people. Who cares if it's like dangerous? I need people, right? So there's a 45% increased risk of mortality in seniors who report feeling lonely. And it's beyond seniors. We can be in a crowd of people and still feel lonely. So this always makes me think of our dean, and I'm going to come to this at the end, where we have to have this, we have a whole concept of Jama, right? Being together. So we'll come to that. Now, like I said earlier, guys, I know we might feel 20. We might feel 21, but we're not. I hope, sorry to break it to you. But as we get older, right, we have, again, all these metabolic processes that are occurring is, and byproducts. So unfortunately, our immune system changes with aging. That's why, as you can see right now with this pandemic, the people that are the most susceptible are the elderly because they can't fight off the virus. Their immune system not up to par. And this is why even when people have underlying issues, their immune system is affected. Right? As one gets older, we see a decline in specific reactions to infections like flu, which is acquired immunity, but we see an increase in nonspecific innate immune reaction. Right? So this is where like the body is like, you know, let's go here, let's go there, let's go here, let's go there. Right? Also, these damaged cells and debris, we call it molecular garbage, inflow garbaging. Uh, that's the real world, real word. Um, these increase. Right? And then there's disposal decreases. So this also provokes the inflammatory response. So we're not able to get rid of a lot of these byproducts as we age. Other things that affect inflammation, physical inactivity. We are way sedentary, right? So we're kind of halfway through. So let's all take a quick stretch break. Everyone stand, stretch. This is really good stretch. Um, I was at a seminar that we did 
and um, you, maybe you can do it. Everyone's mics are off if you want, but you basically put your hands up in the air, you're stretching up, and then you just kind of like bring your hands down as you bend over and you kind of groan out all your frustrations. Ah! Right? So we actually did that at a seminar. It was so therapeutic. Um, so, you know, so if you need to get up and stretch, go for it. But think of how inactive we are now. Literally, especially now. Right? So physical inactivity directly increases inflammation because our body is meant to move. On the flip side, however, let's not go gung-ho either. Right? I know people, they're like, oh, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I don't know, these little high intensity activities. I'm not going to name certain places, but they're orangey places. <laughs> and they'll go to these workouts and do these high intense workouts every day. That's actually very inflammatory for the body, by the way. So you don't want to do high to intensity workouts every day because our body's not used to that. We need to have like a mixture of activity. So some days, you know, I'm doing maybe a hike, maybe I do yoga, Tai Chi, right? I do my resistance training two, three times a week. I can do my, you know, high intensity interval training two couple times a week. You know, have a variety. And that's the key overall, everyone, is we need variety, not only in what we're eating, but we need variety in our activity. We need variety in our self-care, right? So I'm going to come back to this. You know, I'm going to cycle back on things that we can do in just a moment. But right now I'm talking about things that affect us. Poor sleep is associated with increased inflammatory cytokines. Think about it. You don't get enough sleep. You don't get good quality sleep. How are you feeling the next day? Right? Cranky, mad right? We're not going to make a salad. We're not going to go exercise because I'm cranky. I'd rather go sleep, right? And then this starts affecting other people. Then you have short fuse, right? It starts like adding up. When we have poor sleep, we're in a hypercortisol state because again, it's stressful for our body. If we're stressed and we're not getting enough sleep, we can have chronic insomnia. This can also be hormonal too. A lot of pe women during menopause really deal with um, insomnia <coughs> because of the hormones. But this chronic insomnia can actually accelerate brain aging. It can cause neuronal damage, impairs clearance of brain toxins. When we're not sleeping enough, people are awake at night. Okay, I'm going to eat. And again, no one's eating salad in the middle of the night. Right? I'm going to go get that pint of ice cream. Oh, wow, I have leftover you know, fried chicken. All right, I'll have that. And this is very confusing for the body because evolutionarily wise, we didn't sleep so late. Do you know of anyone in olden times like getting up and just like, you know, being awake in the middle of the night? I mean, if they're praying in the middle of the night, that's a different story. Totally different story. That's a very therapeutic, right? Prayer, and I'm going to come to that at the end. That's a good thing. But you didn't see anyone in olden times just going to get up and just, you know, just be up. But now think about it, right? We're just Netflixing and chilling late into the night hour, right? eating. And our body's like, what is going on here? We're supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be like clearing out detox. People always talk to me about detox. Should I drink a juice to detox? I'm like, no, you should eat good. You should sleep and you should watch your stress levels to detox. That's the only detox. You don't need any of these gimmicks, guys, honestly. These supplements and stuff like that, like beware of that stuff. Just the other day, I saw this um, article, in one of my nutrition journals that said they actually have found like residual toxins in supplements. But the supplement industry is not regulated, everyone. The FDA is very busy. They'll regulate drugs and medications, but they don't regulate supplements. So we have to really be wary and careful about some of the supplements that we are taking, the quality of those supplements. Do you really need some of those supplements? Because there are you know, upper limits to some of these things, right? So for example, um, vitamin A, right? Vitamin A is an antioxidant. Right? Vitamin A is very important for vision, right? But if we have too much vitamin A, it can actually increase risk of brain, oh, sorry, of bone fractures. Vitamin E, also a very powerful antioxidant. But high amounts of vitamin E, if we take it in pill form, can actually increase risk of brain hemorrhaging. So we really have to make sure that we are taking supplements because we are deficient. We have a lab test to show that. And we have to be very wary of what these supplements are and how much we're taking. 
So just be careful. My philosophy is like, just get it through the food. But if you are deficient, then yes, take the supplement. Make sure it has the US, um, I think it's USP uh, symbol on there, NSF symbol. There are little sim sim symbols on supplements that show that they, there are different groups that will like look to make sure that whatever's in the product is in the product, the quality of it. But just be careful. Again, don't just be like, oh, hey, I read this online or my favorite influencer told me to take this supplement I'm in. You know, just watch out. Even amino acids, right? I see some like, People, um, they're trying to build muscles and they're taking these amino acids. I'm like, you don't need to take that. Your body's making that. So just be careful of the supplement industry. I know a lot of stuff sounds good and we want the magic fix, the magic pill, but you got to be careful because remember, how do I know some of the stuff in there is not triggering my inflammation and making it worse? Now, yum, yum, <laughs> right? Diet, foods can be very inflammatory. And I know we've all felt this in different ways. Right? So the urban industrial food pattern, how we're eating now, lots of calories. Look at the quality of calories we eat. Right? Even Ramadan, think about when you broke your fast, what did you eat? Right? So a lot of calories, we're very low in plant food. So when we don't eat plants, this is actually negative for the body. So low in plant foods, so we're low in fiber. We eat these hyper palatable, energy dense foods. These foods are like a party in our brain. And the more we eat, the more we want of some of these foods. <coughs> I gave this example of this story last time, so I'm just gonna give it again. So if you heard it before, apologies, but it's one of my favorite stories. But they did a lab a study on um, mice and they gave them sugar and they gave them crack cocaine. And then they offered them these things again later. What do you think these rats or mice preferred to eat? What did they choose? Sugar. So sugar is very, very addictive, right? And I always have to give this in this disclaimer because people hear different things. So I am not promoting cocaine at all, but I'm just saying that it is very <laughs> addictive, right? To, to mice and potentially to us as well. So we have to watch some of these foods and like the food industry, you guys, they don't have our best interests. And I don't think anyone doubted that. They don't have our best interest. There's something called industrial psychology that really looks at what, how can we get these consumers to buy our product over and over? How can we get them addicted? Right? Um, this is where I wish we had like an interactive class where I could actually like see you guys. Then I would do a little poll. But what do you guys think like the perfect chip is? You can put it in the chat box if you want, which I can't even look at anyways right now. But <laughs> what do you think the perfect chip was or is according to the food industry, according to its texture, according to its taste? They've actually done research on this. Let me see if I see the thing. So I don't see anything. Okay, it's actually Cheetos, right? And some of you are thinking, what? Um, but yeah, Cheetos, right? It's like you eat it. It's like air. <laughs> it has like just the right crisp. How many kids do we know that are literally addicted to flaming hot Cheetos, right? So the food industry does a lot of research. How can we get people addicted to this stuff? So these hyper palatable, energy dense, addictive foods are again, also really affecting our inflammatory levels. Processed starches and sugars, sugar sweetened beverages, high fat meat and milk product consumption, right? Including red meat. Red meat, which is beef and lamb, very inflammatory because of what these animals are being fed and injected, right? I can't tell you how many patients I have. They're like, oh, I cut out their red meat. Oh my gosh, I feel so much better. My bones, my joints just feel amazing, right? Now, that doesn't mean, okay, wow, I'm going to reduce my red meat and I'm going to eat more chicken because all meats are inflammatory for the body. Look at how meats, again, are quote unquote produced, factory farmed. 
Look at the size of some of this stuff. Like, look at chicken breast, <coughs> right? Look at it, it's huge. I remember last year we were in um, Southern Spain and I remember we had gone to this halal restaurant that everyone always talks about there and we ordered the chicken. And I remember I looked at it, I'm like, where's the rest of it? It was so small <laughs> that I was like, wait a minute, this is how chicken's supposed to look. This is how it's supposed to be. But we are not used to that anymore, right? So if, uh, if you ever go back to, you know, um, different countries or, you know, if you have people visit, they note this. So our meat is very different than it used to be. And it is very inflammatory because these animals are fed grains. They are fed grains, corn, right? Corn is very high in omega-6s. Omega-6s are these different type of fatty acids. These are essential fatty acids. Um, is omega-3s. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So omega-3s, um, EPA, DHA, the, the good forms of omega-3s actually come from marine life. So algae and plankton, which we do not eat right now, but stay tuned, guys. It probably is going to be algae, guacamole. I'm still waiting for that to show up in the, on the shelves. Um, but since we don't eat that stuff, um, we instead eat the fish that eat those. So the omega-3 rich fish are like salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, tuna, trout, right? These are the omega-3 rich fish. It doesn't mean the other fish are not high in omega-3, but they're not as high as these. So I call them the fatty fish, the fishy fish, right? And this also goes back to our cultures. Like I wish I could eat sardines because sardines actually you know, rich in omega-3s, they, they eat their bones, we got calcium in there, right? But that's not something that we grew up with, right? And I remember one year someone had given us something with sardines and um, I didn't know, so I like heated it. And my brother's like, I'll eat it. So we heat it, oh my gosh, the house stunk. It smelled so bad. We're like, don't do it, don't eat it, it's horrible. So anyways, that kind of goes back to, you know, again, things that we're used to. So trying to broaden our horizons and try some of this stuff. Um, but in any case, so those are the omega-3 rich fish. So these are high in EPA, DHA. But the thing with fish is they are high in contaminants, right? So we have to be careful when we are, and we're overfishing, by the way. So a lot of the fish that we're eating now, our kids and grandkids are probably never going to be exposed to. So we have to be careful. So when we're getting fish, you guys mix it up. The recommendation for the American Heart Association is about two servings of fish each week. And one serving is like the size of a deck of cards. So a small amount, three ounces, like twice a week, so six ounces um, and a variety. <coughs> so don't be like just, okay, salmon, 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 everyday salmon, like mix it up. One day I'll have salmon, one day I'll have trout. Next week I'll have, um, what's it called? Uh, swai, and maybe I'll have tuna. So like mix it up, different types of fish. Because again, they have contaminants. So we have to be careful and we want to, again, have um, a balance and moderation. Now, if you're like, I'm not into fish and especially those fish, no way. So there's flaxseed, chia, right? Soy, but remember with soy, as I talked about in uh, last session, we want organic soy, non-GMO soy in small portions. Um, if you are going to do soy, it's not for everybody. Um, there are a lot of foods that are fortified with omega-3s now. Um, uh, so anyways, so those are the, the anti-inflammatory fatty acids, omega-3s. But then there's omega-6s. So omega-6s, we tend to find in corn oil, safflower, soybean, sorry, not soybean, sorry, uh, sesame, grapeseed. I know some of you are like, what? I thought grapeseed's good for me. Grapeseed oil is actually high in omega-6s. Also, um, corn oil, sesame, um, safflower, uh, I'm kind of going through it in my head, vegetable oils even, uh, grapeseed. So omega-6s, again, in small amounts are fine, but high amounts of omega-6s are actually inflammatory to the body. So our processed food supply usually uses omega-6s, right? You'll see soybean oil in a lot of these um, Soybean oil is a very cheap oil and it is GMO. It's everywhere, right? 
Um, so you'll find a lot of these oil, corn oil, right? And this is the stuff that's being fed to animals as well. So animals actually now have a higher ratio of omega-6s. So when we eat that stuff, this is going to trigger more inflammation. Because we want to have a balance of omega-3s and omega-6s. And unfortunately, our diets are more high in omega-6s. So that's why I don't recommend cooking with, with grapeseed oil or corn oil or safflower or soy or things because we're already getting it in our food supply, right? So that's something that we have to be wary of. All right. So moving along, also refined and enriched flours are rich, uh, sorry, in um, anti or inflammatory uh, particles, sugar, sweetened beverages, as I mentioned, right? High fat foods, fried foods. Okay, sorry. I'm like, slides are getting mixed up here. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Let me go back. Okay. So also, what's happening here with my slides, guys? Okay, here we go. Also, oxidative stress. So when we see an imbalance between the body's production of free radicals and, and the body's ability to detoxify the harmful effects using antioxidants, right? So this is a, a thing. So all this fried food, yum, yum, as we can see right here. And so when we have this imbalance too much free radicals <coughs> as i mentioned earlier sorry guys i will ting little tingle in my throat so if we're not able to detoxify right by having antioxidants that we get from fruits vegetables plant-based foods right and there's an imbalance here this triggers inflammation right too much sugar and fat get dumped into the cells into the mitochondria and this can produce even more excess free radicals. This can cause damage and more inflammation. There's something called ALS. Don't worry, guys, no quiz. This is when we see these oxidized lipid end products. When we're like heating oil for long periods of time at, and at high temperatures, we get this oxidization, oxidation, right? And this can also trigger the inflammation. So we have to really watch it, you guys, you know, how we're heating foods. If you like to like eat charred meat, right? The charring of the meat, the high levels of heat have now affected the integrity of the oil. Oxidative stress can come from too much sugar. There's no benefit to sugar. I think I talked about this before. People are like, oh, what's a good sugar? I'm like, nothing. There's, there's no good sugar. The only sugar like I'm okay with is honey, and that's only because it's a sunna food, but even that's in small amounts. So high sugars in our blood, hyperglycemia, can drive this oxidative stress, right? And you know how like, um, if you caramelize something, right, if you're making creme brulee or whatever, you see that caramelized, you know, uh, sugar layer, so this oxidation, that's basically oxidation, you're applying heat, right? This can occur in our body and create these advanced glycation end products, ages. And this can also wait, activate inflammation. So that's why, you guys, if we have too much sugar, this is all affecting our body. And too much sugar can, when we eat too much sugar, you guys, it does become stored as fat. It does become stored as triglyceride in our body. So if any of you have high triglyceride levels, you actually have to reduce the sugars you're consuming. And what happens is when there's too much sugar, it becomes, and our body can use what it needs, you know, for energy. If it has an excess amount of sugar, it gets stored as um, glycogen in our liver and in our muscle cells. And if we have even more excess amount, which we do a lot of times, then it can get stored as triglyceride. This can get into the fat, um, sorry, into our cells. And this can mess with the signaling of our cells, which can lead to insulin resistance. So diabetes is not necessarily because we ate too much carbohydrate. It is because we ate too much sugar, too much refined sugars, which then become these fats. So we really have to really look differently at carbs. And I talked about this in the, in the beginning of the year. We had a new year, new you class um, that I did where I talked about carbohydrates and they're not evil right? But the quality of the carbohydrates, that's what we have to look at. 
So how does one heal? So now that was all my little background, right? And hopefully you guys already have some ideas of things that you need to work on. I think, you know, hopefully you kind of saw what's going on with you, what maybe is affecting you. But now let's flip into now what? Because what can we do? And I just love this picture. Like I just want to just stare at it. Right? It's just so therapeutic, isn't it? <laughs> so how does one heal? What can we do? All right, meal spacing. So we just finished with Ramadan. Right? Some of you might be fasting right now for Shawwal, or some of you might be fasting for the, um, the white days, right? The, the days of the full moon, right? This is actually one of the best things we can do, is fasting. It's also very hard, I know. That's one thing I always struggle with but it actually is so beneficial for the body because we're reducing caloric intake. We're giving our body a rest, basically. We're not consuming all these you know, foods that can potentially have these you know, uh, oxidized end products, right? So we, there's actually studies that have looked at Muslims like after Ramadan and our inflammatory markers go down. But it all depends on how we fasted, right? So if you're like, yeah, fasting is no problem. At a far time, I have all my fried food cornucopia. And then that's like defeating the purpose. Right? And again, I'm not saying don't eat that stuff. I'm really big on moderation. I, I always tell people every Ramadan, I'm like, no, let's not even pretend we're not going to eat fried foods in Ramadan. Let's not even pretend. It's okay to have, you know, a little bit once in a while, no problem, right? But what are we mostly doing is what the key thing is. But fasting is very anti-inflammatory but we have to be smart in how we do it what we're eating before and what we're eating after right now obviously i'm not telling us to fast all the time that's hard you know but once a week twice a week a couple times a month you know as um our tradition uh advises us to do right and in between we can do some intermittent fasting now this is not for everyone so diabetics please speak to your doctor or dietitian. This is not for you, all right? Because for diabetics, you need to be eating regularly spaced meals, right? But for those that are not diabetic, this is actually a really good practice to do, the intermittent fasting. So this is where, and I recommend it like this, where you start with a 12 to 16 hour gap between dinner and your first meal of the day or your breakfast. So try to cut your meals earlier on in the evening. Do you have to eat at 10 o'clock? What is going on over there, right? Our body's not used to that. Like different hormones actually interplay at that time. Uh, our insulin levels actually go up at that time, interestingly enough, right? Growth hormones. Growth hormones can actually accelerate aging. So we don't want to have too much growth hormones circulating but we have high levels of growth hormones circulating if you're eating late at night, right? So cut it off earlier. You know, whatever time you're going to bed, maybe three hours before you're going to go to bed, cut it off. If you're like, hey, I sleep at 3 a.m., I mean, that's scary. You should not be sleeping that late. But let's suppose you're like, okay, fine, I sleep at 1 a.m. You know, just try to sleep a little bit earlier, right? But cut your food off earlier for sure. Right, some years ago, Oprah said seven o'clock, and then I would have all these patients. Oprah told me seven. I'm like, no, Oprah didn't tell you. She was just saying for herself. Um, there's nothing magical that happens at seven o'clock. Don't worry. Um, but th the point being is, is that you know, just cut it off earlier. Whatever your your last meal is, your dinner, just or your, sorry, your sleep time. Excuse me. Whatever time you're going to sleep, a couple hours before bedtime, just dinner. Just the kitchen is closed. Like put a you know, caution sign, close the kitchen down, you know, um, do what you got to do. Do not eat again. Now, obviously, if you're hungry, like legit hunger, like, oh, hey, my stomach is growling. Wow, my head, it's hurting. Wow, I feel jittery. Then yes, eat. But if, usually we're not. So from that last meal to your first meal, try to have a 12-hour gap. If you're like, no, I can't, I feel hungry, then okay, fine, then don't, right? But for many of us, we can do a 12 to 16 hour gap, right? And then just eat smart throughout the day, right? So when we do this, when we have this meal spacing, this intermittent fasting, right? We see decreased levels of inflammation and oxidative damage. We see decrease in the growth hormones, right? And like I said, it's not for everyone. Also, you guys, plants, plants, plants. We have to increase our plant-based intake right? And 
And even think about it. If you're like, yeah, yeah, totally. I eat vegetables all the time. But if you're eating the same vegetables all the time, then we're not getting in all the nutrients and the variety. So this is a challenge to us all. And however many vegetables you're eating right now, try to double it. Right? Um, one of my coworkers and I, we've been telling our patients recently to do like a 15, um, you know, vegetable, and I kind of threw in herbs in there as well, mash. So 15 different vegetables and herbs and stuff, kind of mix it into this little mash. You don't have to mash it up, but like a medley. And then try to eat this throughout the day, right? Just add it to your food. And if you're like, wow, 15, I've never even, I don't even know 15 vegetables. Okay, so that's something we got to work on, right? But whatever you're eating right now, double it, right? Try something new, right? And then just, again, make a medley of it. And then if you want to saute or you want to eat it raw, whatever, and then add it to each meal, right? Let's suppose you're having your, you know, your desi food, fine, whatever. Then just have this on the side, right? Um, Maybe make a soup of it. Do a salad. But the key is, you guys, variety. Mix it up different because there's so many nutrients in vegetables and fruits. And as we're going to talk about in just a moment, like we have chemicals in these plants that talk to our cells. They're literally interacting with our cells and they can activate our genes on or off. And that's the thing a lot of times we tend to think, well, this just runs in my family. Everyone has diabetes, so I'm just going to sit back and get it. No. What we're doing, our lifestyle activates those genes on or off. So just keep that in mind. So plants are rich in antioxidants. These calm down those crazy free radicals I was talking about earlier. Uh, some of these um, plants have polyphenols, which are actually associated with lower, lower risk of inflammation. We see high levels of the antioxidants A, C, and E in a lot of these fruits and vegetables. Um, also, these are rich in phytochemicals. And phytochemicals are plant chemicals. They're actually neuroprotective. They protect our brain. Um, they're vascular protective. We want our arteries to be able to expand, right? Because if our arteries get hard, hardened because of this plaque buildup or whatever, right, then we see increased blood pressure. This can lead to cardiovascular disease. So we want our arteries to be flexible, pliable. And there's something called nitric oxide that can help to do that. And interestingly enough, the green vegetables, especially arugula, interestingly enough, all the green leafies have this have in these perk precursors to nitric oxide. So that's actually a really good um, thing. I'm going to give you, show you a list at the end of foods that I recommend on a daily um, basis. And that's one of the things that I recommend are leafy greens. Um, these plant chemicals can actually decrease detoxification. So they will go in there and detoxify our liver, detoxify all this gunk that's floating around. They're going to decrease platelet aggregation decrease angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is basically all these blood vessels that can congregate around a cell and can, this is what feeds tumor cells. We want to cut that off. And these um, phytochemicals and antioxidants can feed and promote a healthy microbiome. They can even interact with cellular signaling pathways, right? So again, activating genes on and off. Things called catechins. These are present in tea, cocoa, peaches, barley. And again, I'm, a list is coming up. I'm just kind of doing a little preview here. Now, I'm not telling everyone to be vegetarian. Honestly, like for Muslims, I actually don't. <laughs> Only because like our Prophet Muslim, he did eat meat, but he wasn't a huge meat eater. He wasn't eating meat all the time. First of all, it wasn't available all the time, but he did eat meat, right? So I'm really against sometimes when people, I'm just going to become vegan. I'm like, well, I'm really big on this. And I would, you know, just a little bit of meat, maybe once a year, twice a year, whatever you want to do. Um, and make sure it's a good quality right? Get that grass fed. I don't care if it's expensive. If it's expensive, that's good. Then you're going to eat less, right? Um, so I'm more of a proponent of, of course, the prophetic lifestyle, which I'll mention in a moment, but also the Mediterranean. And by Mediterranean, people read this, and they're like, oh, I got to eat falafel and hummus. No, you don't. The Mediterranean lifestyle is a basically, it's a more of a structure. And actually, it's not on here. Uh, I couldn't fit that pyramid. But the real Mediterranean uh, pyramid, the bottom of the pyramid is actually social interaction. 
and physical activity. That's actually foundational, right? But in terms of this is more of the Mediterranean food pyramid. So um, the basis is grains, breads, beans, pasta, nuts. And I would actually flip this a little bit, to be honest. I would actually make the basis fruits and vegetables and legumes, which are beans and lentils. I would kind of flip this a little bit and make it daily. Now, I am personally okay with whole grains. Some people are not, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, but when I talk about whole grains, I'm not talking about you eating, you know, white pasta or whatever. I'm talking about like non-processed whole grains, right? So having the quinoa, right? Having um, amaranth, you know, which, and again, we're seeing a lot of ancient grains hitting the marketplace, but small amounts, not crazy amounts, literally a quarter of our plate, right, once a day, right? But our basis should actually be fruits, vegetables, uh, legumes, um, olive oil in a variable of amounts more on the, on the less side. I'd rather we have like the olives, olives, right? Um, but olive oil is anti-inflammatory. But again, with olive oil, it, ha it can burn pretty quick. So you want to use olive oil as like a dressing, right? Something where it's relatively not heated at high temperature. Extra virgin olive oil is always best. The Palestinian olive oil, always high caliber, uh, the best. But small amounts, like don't go crazy. Right? I remember once it was someone was telling me, I drink a teaspoon of olive oil a day. I'm like, why? Why aren't you using that with your food? Like, don't drink it straight like that. Because it still is a fat at the end of the day. And with fats, everyone, I know we're used to buying like Costco size, let me bulk up, have like five, my bo five bottles and store them. They can oxidize. So you want to have like small amounts, check the expiration dates, keep them in a cool, dark place. You don't have to refrigerate it, but um, you know, be aware of how you're storing your fats. Fish and seafood a few times a week. Again, variety, um, eggs, cheese, poultry, and yogurt. Um, you know, just daily or even weekly, doesn't have to be a daily type thing. And then small amounts of meats and, and sweets spread out. As I mentioned earlier, food is talking to our cells, everybody. So every cell has signaling systems that alert our DNA how we're doing in the food environment. These systems let the DNA know and talk to genes to turn them on and off, especially in our immune system. So when there's a food scarcity, they don't turn on immune system because they can't mount an acute response. Right? And when there's too much inflammatory food, this is very confusing for the body. Right? So just remember that my food's talking to each other. So I want to make sure it's good food. So here we go, guys. The next couple of slides are going to detail the foods and lifestyle changes that we really need to look at. And we really need to be honest with ourselves. I know, you guys, I get it. I had a whole conversation on one of our groups yesterday on donuts. Right? So I'm not saying like we're just being like these <laughs> pristine humans not eating fun stuff. Right? That's okay to you know, bring that in every so often, but what are we mostly eating? That's the key, all right? So here are some anti-inflammatory food checklists. There's a lot more, but here are some of the key ones, and there are, they are in no particular order, okay? I just kind of threw them in there. So whole unprocessed grains. And I know, I know, some of you are gonna be like, what, but I heard grains aren't good for me. Now, the grains that I'm talking about, again, are unprocessed, right? Some people might be sensitive to gluten, and I'm getting there. Don't worry, I'm going to get there. Um, so the non-gluten grains, right, um, you know, you can focus more on those, right, in their non-processed forms. I'm talking about a whole, right? Of course, you can cook them, but small amounts of those actually have been anti-inflammatory, right? They can reduce deep belly fat for some people. We want to boost veggies and fruit and variety. So mix it up. The more, the merrier. Different types as well. Organic, if you can. I know organic is more expensive. So there is something called the Dirty Dozen. So every year, the Environmental Watch Group, which is a consumer group, it evaluates the toxicity levels and pesticide levels of you know, fruits and vegetables. And they put out a list every year. And so try to pick 
uh, so the dirty dozen, those are fruits and vegetables that are high in pesticides. So those are the ones you would want to buy organic if you could. Now, if it's like, you know, straining on um, your finances and you're like, I really just can't afford some of this stuff, then okay, you know, get the non-organic. Something is better than nothing. You know, you can always make a vinegar bath and remove some of the, the pesticide content, but a lot of it's already in there. Um, so it's really, again, it's, this is an individualized thing, but usually we do recommend trying to get the Dirty Dozen as organic. Um, apples are always on that list. Right? Apples usually are very high in pesticide content. And, you know, my patients say, oh, well, I'm just going to peel it. But the peel has a lot of the nutrients. So, I mean, again, it's, it's really hit or miss on, on how you want to do this. Um, so in any case, variety. Right, as I mentioned, doing that 15 um, vegetable, um, maybe even add fruits too, 15 fruits and vegetable medley. Right? So berries are very anti-inflammatory. Right? Berries can even help reduce our blood pressure. Right? So, and they boost our immunity. Blueberries in particular actually boost some of the natural killer cells in our body. Cherries also very potent anti-inflammatory fruit, grapes, tomatoes. And for tomatoes, usually we recommend heating it because that activates the lycopene, which is an antioxidant or sorry, excuse me, a phytochemical in there that can actually help reduce risk of cancer, especially prostate cancer for men. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to have everything raw. Again, heat some stuff, have some stuff raw. Again, variety, mix it up. Carrots, dark green leafies, kale, spinach. Uh, cruciferous are very powerful detoxers. Broccoli, cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, for instance. But the cruciferous vegetables are also very gas forming. So these are vegetables that you want to kind of watch and see how much you're having and how, how it's affecting you. Um, peppers. Peppers are very anti-inflammatory. They have something called capsaicin in there that gets activated. This is an anti-inflammatory. Um, some research indicates if we have peppers like earlier on in the day, it can actually boost our metabolism. So that's interesting to note. Um, mushrooms are very potent, right? Um, and that includes the stalks. And, that, and research is looking at whether mushrooms can actually decrease risk of certain cancers. Spices, so spice it up, especially turmeric. Turmeric is a definitely king, queen, anti-inflammatory spice. And there are a lot of turmeric supplements out there. You know, but again, you guys, I always recommend skidding it through the foods itself. Sprinkle turmeric throughout the day. Our food should be yellow. Um, now, if you have certain joint problems and so forth, um, you know, and you do want to do um, turmeric, you know, just reach out to me. We'll talk about it um, because turmeric supplements for those that have gallbladder issues, kidney issues can actually affect um, possible, you know, gallstones and so forth. So usually we, we don't recommend me mega doses in certain populations, um, but having the natural form is excellent. Ginger is a very powerful anti-inflammatory as well. Saffron um, getting some saffron that can actually even help with migraines. Cinnamon's amazing. Cinnamon can help lower blood sugars. A uh, paprika and chili again have capsaicin, which can help decrease um, inflammation. Herbs are amazing. Basil, oregano, rosemary, or some. These are actually also antibacterial as well. Green tea, very, very powerful anti-inflammatory component in tea called ECGC. Um, also, green tea is a mood enhancer, but for those that are sensitive to caffeine, just have it earlier on in the day, right? Um, you can get one cup of matcha. So matcha is like a powder. And so one cup of matcha is like equivalent to like 10 cups of green tea. So you can do that. And I'm not talking about matcha lattes. Sorry, guys. I know some of you got really excited there for a moment because the milk that they make the latte with can actually affect the polyphenol value in, in the tea. So it kind of takes away. So you want to have it, you know, um, without any of that. Healthy fats. So the monounsaturated fats, avocado, um, walnuts, which are, uh, walnuts, by the way, are omega-3s. So really nice to have that. Almonds, um, olives are excellent fats. But just remember with all this stuff, you guys, they are fat. 
So too much fat can make us fat, right? Because our body's not differentiating. Oh, hey, I'm eating avocado. Okay, I'm not going to count this, right? I wish it did that, but it didn't. Um, so just be cognizant of how much you're having with the nuts and literally a handful. So everyone take a look at your hand. If you have a big hand, then look at a smaller hand. <laughs> um, but literally a handful of nuts a day is excellent, right? For those that have thyroid issues, if one Brazil nut has selenium in there, all you really need, that's really good. Sorry, guys, not chocolate covered, sorry. Um, so these are really excellent. Avocado, you can get those little really cute little um, mini avocados. I've seen them like at Trader Joe's. You can even get those. Get, eat half of that one day, wrap it up and surround wrap. The next day, eat the other half. That's an appropriate portion. Seeds are really excellent too. There's some research, and I don't have time to talk about that, how seeds can even affect our hormones. There's something called seed cycling. Um, so that's a whole other area for another time. But flaxseed, chia, hemp are excellent as well. Flaxseed, you want to grind it up. Um, when you buy flax, flaxseed, and if you do buy a ground up, you want to keep it in the fridge. Because remember, these are fats. Fats you know, can go rancid. So you know, keep it in the fridge. If you want to like, do your own, like, uh, grind up your own flaxseed, that would actually be better because then you are retaining some of those um, healthy fats. And sprinkle it everywhere. Um, flaxseed, there's some research showing it could even help fight tumor cells. So that's a really big thing. It can also bring down our cholesterol levels. So it's a very powerful seed. Dark chocolate and cocoa. And for cocoa, it's got to be 70% cocoa or more, right? Be careful of the sugar content, ideally less than five grams. Good luck with that because <laughs> a lot of them have more, but Fine, I'll extend it out, less than 10 grams. Fatty fish and oils in moderate amounts, like I mentioned, extra virgin olive oil, salmon, mackerel, herring, trout, tuna, sardines, as I mentioned earlier, these are the omega-3 rich fish. If you wanna go hardcore, right, get the algae and plankton, I don't know where, but it's out there somewhere. Microalgae, um, those are also rich in omega-3. So these are all some of the anti-inflammatory foods. Now bone broth, I haven't seen a lot of research on that, um, unfortunately, but, you know, a lot of people swear by it, um, you know, but if you are going to do bone broth, you know, and you're making it yourself, you want to make sure the bones are high quality from organic grass fed animals, um, you know, but that can be very helpful. And, you know, we had a discussion in one of our threads about collagen. I'm sorry, collagen supplements. There just isn't definitive research on them. I'm sorry. Like, you ha we have to look at the studies. We have to look at the quality of the studies. Unfortunately, it's not showing any benefits per se, but collagen, just get it through food. It, you know, so things like bone broth. Um, vitamin C is a precursor to collagen. So if we have good amounts of vitamin C in our body, that's essential. All these vitamins and minerals work together to activate these things, right? So minerals are very important too. I feel like I should do a separate class on minerals and vitamins because minerals like like zinc, selenium, magnesium. Magnesium is responsible, or not responsible, it's, it helps with 400 different processes in our body. So if we're low in magnesium, right, it affects our body, right? B vitamins, very important for energy extraction. So we want to get all these things naturally from foods. They all affect each other, right? Minerals actually can help us to if we have high metal and toxin content in our body, they can actually help to detoxify that. So again, I feel like another class coming on with all that information. Um, so stay tuned, we'll see. Now, as I've mentioned before in different sessions, nutrition is very individualized. There is no um, you know, blanket diet. Everyone eat this. That's why I never do like meal plans. People just tell me what to eat. I can't tell you how many times people email me or message me. I just need you to tell me what to eat. I'm like, okay, well, what do you currently eat? That's where we got to start with. What do you currently eat? That's how I work. Because I can't give you a blanket statement diet because it doesn't work for everybody. We are sensitive to different things. So this is where we have to be detectives. And look, what happens when I eat these things? How does my body feel? How do I mentally and emotionally feel? So this is one thing I would suggest is you can do an elimination here. So 
this is the order I would go in is first eliminate sugar. And this is not like fruit. I'm not ever saying to eliminate fruit, never. Uh, I'm talking about added sugars. So take out the sugar, right? Maybe I'll do a sugar challenge again. I don't know. Maybe I will. Email me if you guys are interested. Maybe we'll have a sugar challenge group again. Um, or it's like 14 days of no added sugar. It's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, cut out the sugar. See how you feel. For many people, this is a very key factor in inflammation. Sugar really drives a lot of inflammation in the body. It can create dysbiosis in our gut. Dairy is another thing because our dairy nowadays chock full of hormones and I don't know what else, antibiotics, right? Um, several years ago, they found that little girls were hitting puberty like age five and they traced it back to hormones injected in cows. So that's out, luckily. But for many people that are sensitive to dairy, again, it's, everyone's different. So what happens if you cut out like the cow's milk, right? How do you feel? right? Now, I mentioned in the previous session about yogurt. Yogurt's a little bit different because, again, it's kind of a fermented, I guess you can say, dairy. So it's a little bit different. You know, so some people are sensitive to that. Some people aren't. But check and see. And the things that you're checking to see are energy levels, bloating. For dairy, there is a close association with um, like eczema, right? Skin issues, right? So check those things out. See how you're feeling. Um, gluten, I don't know why there's a grape there. Okay, gluten does not look like grapes. But sorry, wrong graphic. But gluten is a protein. And this is usually found in wheat, rye, and barley. It's not in all grains. Some grains get contaminated by gluten because they're produced in like they're like they're processed in the factory. So for example, a lot of time oats, oats actually do not have gluten. Oats are gluten-free. But if oats are processed and manufactured, not actually manu not manufactured, but processed in factories that are also manufacturing wheat, rye, or barley, there might be cross-contamination. Now, gluten is a problem for people to have celiac. Now, celiac is a disease. You will know if you have celiac because literally it's like an allergic reaction, I guess you can say, in the body where the body is reacting to this protein. All right, so there's intestinal issues, um, cognitive mood issues and so on and so forth. So it's actually a disease. Not everyone has celiac, which means not everyone has to avoid gluten. But some people are sensitive to gluten, where if they eat wheat, rye, or barley, especially in the processed forms, right, they are going to feel that fatigue, feel that bloating. Like I know even with myself, if I eat like white bread, like lots of white bread, I, I literally feel very bloated. So I'm like, okay, it's not working for me. So you would check and see. And one thing that I would suggest is, you know, because again, I'm really big on like ancient grains. Because again, that to me, it's, that, that's a prophetic food. All right, our populism ate grains, but in small amounts again. And it was different. It was very non-processed. So I really hate to cut that stuff out. I really do. But those are usually the, the non-gluten grains, interestingly enough. Um, for some people, but in any case, um, going back to this. So you need to check and see how am I feeling? And first cut out the enriched flours. So if it says enriched, you know, wheat, things like that, then you cut that out and see how you, you feel, right? Don't eat grains in the evening. See what happens, right? For a lot of people, they feel like, okay, if I, if I don't eat grains in the evening, I, I feel a lot better in the morning, right? So those are the big ones, the big food sensitivities, sugar, dairy, gluten. Soy could be a sensitivity for some people, but this is more so like the GMO or non-organic soy. Um, soy I talked about in a previous session, I don't wanna talk about it right now, but it's not as evil as it's made out to be. It's not going, it doesn't have estrogen, it has phytoestrogen, which is something different. There are also phytochemicals and antioxidants in there that are very beneficial, but for soy, if you're gonna have it again, non-GMO, organic, small quantities, like literally like a cup of soy milk or you know, tofu or tempeh, but in its non-processed form. And even certain vegetables might be causing sensitivities, like the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, right? Um, what's it called? Uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, right? Now, I know there's a whole thing on lectins. I don't even talk about lectins right now. 
And I'm actually, I, I'm not really a fan of that because lectins are components that are found in things like raw beans and things like that. No one's eating raw beans. Usually people eat beans like, like pinto beans and um, black beans. They usually cook them. So it's not a problem. So don't jump on that lectin um, bandwagon because if lectins were a problem, like so much of the Hispanic population and other population in the world would be like dead. Um, so just, okay, are you back? You good? Just give us one minute, Rufi, to get sure. everyone, just uh, 20 seconds. All right, go ahead. All right. So really quickly, guys, so if you had typed in previous questions, then I don't think we have those up. So um, maybe we can, if you guys want to type them in, um, feel free to do so. So I'm almost done, guys. Hang in there. We're, we're making it. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Okay. All right. So let's talk about also, because remember, you guys, it's, just, it's not just the food. That's a big area. And I do want you guys to keep track. And if you need, again, you guys have my email. We'll put it again in the, in the chat screen at the end. So feel free to email me. We'll try to figure out what's going on as much as we can. But I need you to do the homework. That Are there certain foods and sensitivities that you're seeing? So just what you would do, you would eliminate these. Start with sugar, cut it out for two weeks, see how you're feeling. If you're like, no, I still feel like garbage. Okay, then cut out the dairy, right? And see how you're feeling. No, I still feel like that. Okay, then cut out the gluten, see how you're feeling. So we would go in steps. All right. Now, also, I want us to focus on sleep. Right now, I know, you know, we always hear seven to nine hours, and that would like actually stress me out. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting seven hours. But like for us in our deen, you know, I had a good friend say it's beyond that. It could be like there could be baraka in our sleep. So we don't necessarily need seven to nine, we just need refreshing sleep. And it really differs per, pe per person. Right? So if you're waking up tired and, we, and you're just like, well, this is it. I'm just tired. This is my life. No, that's not. Right? A lot of times we get used to feeling a certain way and that's the norm. No, it's not. So see, you know, again, the quality of your sleep. There are some really good apps and things that can help with sleep. I mean, there's even an app of, of a man or a lady who's like reading a, like some sort of textbook or something in a very boring way. <laughs> so that helps people sleep. So in any case, um, so work on your sleep. Movement. So at least 20 minutes for anti-inflammatory effects. So just 20 minutes, ideally go for a quick walk, right? Ideally in nature, ideally with the sun. If you're like, I can't, there's like walk videos online you can do as well. So you don't necessarily have to do that, but some sort of 20 minute movement, yoga, Tai Chi, also really helpful. Stress management, that's a whole separate beast of a session. But how are you perceiving your stress? That is something we really have to look at. How am I viewing this as a threat or as a challenge? So is this really a big deal, right? So again, that's a whole separate session. Maybe Hedwa, uh, we can do that later on with somebody else <laughs> that's trained in that field or more in depth. Um, being more mindful, right? Just slowing it down, right? Being mindful when you eat. Do I have to eat this? I just had one slice. Why am I having another slice, right? Um, so really asking yourself, slowing it down, Right? This is associated with low, lower levels of perceived stress, depression, and anxiety, with improved mood, improved well-being, gratitude. Right? If you're having one of those days where like, everything's hitting you, right? just write down five things you're grateful for. If you're like, I feel like I'm grateful for nothing right now, okay, then write down five things that bring you joy. Right? Five things that went right that day. Having a gratitude journal, but the research actually shows that we don't need to be writing every day gratitude journal because then it becomes kind of like um, like routinized. So maybe once a week you write about things that you're grateful for. Maybe once a week you're writing about things that bring you joy, things you enjoy doing. Um, maybe every so often write about things that went right that day. You know, write about things that you're changing. 
So it's really helpful. And it's something very powerful about pen to paper. This could be something that you do, you know, maybe you check in with someone and do this together. Because again, we want to have that aspect of social uh, connective, connectivity, right? Massage. Well, right now we can't because of this whole situation. So if you go out and get a massage, um, research actually shows that does increase some of the feel-good hormones, endorphins, right? So I wish massage was covered in a lot of healthcare organizations as like um, a necessary service. It's not, um, but it actually has a lot of therapeutic benefits to it. Arts, right? So doing art, if you're like, I'm not an artist and look at art, right? So I have some nice pictures here, a little, it's kind of got cut in my slide, but arts, um, reading, poetry, whatever it is. Also, Minimize the intake of antibiotics and NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the ibuprofen um, medications, right? So decrease that. Also not on this slide, but um, should be on this slide, is really look at the toxins that we're consuming, that we are inhaling, right? That we're exposed to, right? In a lot of areas, we can't help that, right? For those who live in Southern California, I know many of us as kids remember smog days, right? Where you know we weren't allowed to have PE because there was just so much smog out there, right? So unfortunately, you know we can't control. I mean now we don't have that, but you know I think about that. I'm like, how do I know how much toxins I consumed as a kid, right? Inhaled. So in any case, so watch the environmental toxin exposure that you have. What are you using as household products, right? There is really good research on yoga and tai chi. Right? We see decreased cortisol levels decrease anxiety and depression, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so there's autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic ner nervous system. So sympathetic is like more like the relaxation. This will counteract the stress response. And it can actually start with deep breathing, right? So that's a really helpful way to activate that. Um, religious services, right? Religion, Right? So I always think about that. I'm like, you know, we're really lucky that we have this amazing tradition. Right? And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Positivity programs, trying to be positive, fake it if you got to do it. There's a really good tech, TED Talk online. Um, the presenter's name is Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. And she talks a lot about the power pose. And the power pose actually is a way to decrease our cortisol levels, boost our testosterone levels. Um, you know, and this can actually affect our um, self-esteem. It's a very interesting um, talk. I really highly recommend. Being out in nature, 20 minutes. Again, this is all research-based. Everything I'm saying here has like good research on it to help us lower our inflammation levels. So we actually see lowered cortisol and quieted activity in the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, this is the part of our brain that um, is involved with willpower and decision making, right? Uh, and this usually becomes hyperactive in depression, unfortunately. So just going out there and sitting in nature is very therapeutic. Now, to bring all this and tie it into our tradition, our tradition, the prophetic lifestyle is the, the premier <laughs> anti-inflammation regimen, right? I want to do a book on this eventually, something, um, where we really, like, this is it. Everything has been handed to us, everything. If we just did it, we don't need these fad diets. We don't need these gimmicks out there. So we take a look at the prophetic lifestyle on, on a broader level, right? Less food, especially less processed food. Right? More plant-based. We do not need meat every day. We will survive. Don't worry. We will get protein <coughs> from beans and lentils and other things like that. Right? Even grains have protein. So don't worry. We'll be good. Um, fast regularly. Right? Team up with someone. I know it's really hard. Again, Ramadan, we're like superpower, right? Because we have, we're doing it together. It's the bark of the, of the month, of course. But when we do this regularly, it becomes a habit, right? So this is excellent prayer, right? Not prayer like a chicken where everything's like super speed, but like slow it down, contemplation. I remember someone was telling me, you know, they're like, oh yeah, you know, there's a lot of apps that can help 
you know, um, with self care and just slowing down. And I'm like, yeah, prayer five times a day. We got it <laughs> right already prescribed to us, right? But prayer, where again, we're slowing it down. We have contemplation, right? This is very powerful, right? Zikr, right? Being out in nature and doing that, right? Gratitude right? This is in our tradition. We are supposed to be grateful for all the blessings that we have. Service, right? Helping others out, right? And this brings in the social interconnectedness, right? We talked about loneliness earlier. Now, I know right now with the, the massages are slowly opening, social distance and all that. Um, and I know once the massages, once, you know, this, everything quote unquote calms down. I know we all are going to appreciate this stuff more than we ever have. Right. So this is really a reminder to us of, of how much we miss gatherings and how important they are. Again, not only just for our mental health, but just physical health as well. Right. So this is something to really work on. It's not like, okay, I'm going to have a thousand threads with different friends. No, like talk to people. Hello, phone. Remember that? Meeting people face to face, again, six feet apart right now. There's something about that that's very powerful. And I know some of us might be, you know, introvert, introverts and we're not into that, but it, I'm not saying a thousand people, like just even one other person. We have like soul nourishing time. I remember once I had talked to um, a friend who actually is a health coach and she's like, four hours. I'm like, four hours? She's like, yeah, four hours of soul nourishing time. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know where she had the four hours. It's very fascinating. But like, you know, it, it was, I really thought about that because I'm like nowadays, you know, or previous to, to, to COVID, right? Think about when we would schedule meeting friends and family. I can schedule you for August because I'm just so busy. Right? Doing what? Right? And we would meet if we met, it was like quick, one hour in out. When I move on to my next thing. And we went like, think about it, how much of that was like quality time, right? And it doesn't have to be quality time where we're like talking nonstop, but just like, I'm good in your company, All right? So that's a really powerful anti-inflammatory. And that is totally intertwined in our tradition. Prophetic superfoods, right? Pomegranates, dates, figs. These are black seeds right here. Grapes, olives, right? These are foods that we want to have on a regular basis. And I don't have time to get into some of the, the qualities of these superfoods, um, because, you know, they could actually be anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. I'm trying to pull it up on my other computer and my other computer's dead right now. So apologies. That could be another time. But just basically, no, you guys, all these foods, when we intertwine them, you know, day to day, some of the other foods that I'm going to be mentioning, right, very powerful for our overall health. Now, this is um, a research-based list. So all these foods and by the way, you guys, some of these foods are quote unquote hot, right? So this is where I would recommend, because I'm not an expert in, you know, uh, the prophetic medicine, you know, that's a whole other field and area of, of TIB medicine. And there are really good practitioners. I know we have a sister, Perry Ansari, on the East Coast that deals with this. There's Hakeem Salim in the UK. There's a lot of uh, people out there, and I'm sure others, and I apologize, others in your community that deal with this, it's people, that, people that also deal with functional food and in our community in SoCal, we have um, Sister Zermina, you know, that deals with on the functional realm. And these are people, practitioners, I would recommend like, connecting to, you know, for that next step, I guess you can say. Um, but in any case, including those foods, but also, sorry, sorry, going back, I, I forgot my train of thought, going back. Some of these foods, again, are hot. So for example, for some people, because of their temperament, um, they can't have too much black seed because it's too hot, right? So this is where, again, I would recommend talking to someone, you know, um, that is trained in the prophetic medicine to see kind of what your um, temperament is, you know, because there's certain foods that would work for you versus not work for you. So that's just something to keep in mind. But having small amounts is fine, but I don't want us to overdo it. So I don't want to be like, oh, hey, wow, black seed is really good for me. I'm going to have like a tablespoon every day. That might be too much for you. So all this stuff, small amounts. These are foods that um, I would recommend to aim for regularly. So a fistful of dark green vegetables daily. So this would be like uh, spinach, bok choy, arugula, 
kale. Um, so all these dif different dark green leafies, these are very powerful um, anti-inflammatory. They can also be important for cardiovascular health, for cognitive health, so literally a fistful, just literally. And these are things like, like have like a checklist um, on your fridge of things like I got to make sure every day I get this stuff. So a fistful of dark green leafies, um, one cup cooked. So that's, that's basically what three servings are. So three servings are equivalent to one cup cooked. Of, again, the ancient grains, ideally like the non-gluten ones if you can. So that would be like everything but wheat, um, barley, and rye. But there's lots of other grains, you guys, as you can see. There's quinoa, there's amaranth, there's bulgur, there's millet, there's taff, farro, um, oats, oatmeals. Um, like old fashioned or seal cut. So like, I oh, just like a cup a day cooked, have it maybe earlier on in the day. Uh, one serving, which is equivalent to half a cup cooked of legumes, which is beans or lentils daily. If you're like, oh no, I'm not into that yet. Okay, then at least three times a week to start off. Berries, all the berries, whatever berries, blueberries, strawberries, goji berries, mulberries, um, half a cup daily or at least three times a week. I would do daily. Very like, on so many levels, berries are some of the most powerful fruits out there. Flaxseed, as I mentioned earlier, the benefits, a tablespoon, just work up to that ground, um, or um, you just kind of, you know, uh, three times a week if, it's, if it feels like it's too overwhelming. Turmeric, about, actually I would increase that to a, a table, sorry, a teaspoon and a half, so one and a half teaspoons daily. A handful of nuts, variety, um, and then green tea daily. Oh, and then that's it, you guys. We are, let me kind of go back there, at the end of our session here. So again, there's a lot more we could talk about and go into, but like I said, interest of time, otherwise it'd be a whole other um, separate session. We're gonna end, we're a little bit over our time anyway, so apologies for that. So um, let me take a look at the questions here. Can you see the questions right here or should yes. I read them to you? I got them. I can okay. see. Okay. Um, so you mentioned about being mindful of supplements. What is a food that we can eat naturally that will increase iron if we're deficient? So this is a great question because a lot of women are um, deficient in, in, um, in iron, especially pregnant women um, in the second and third trimester. That's a given usually. Um, so for iron, um, if you are very deficient, you, for this, you would have to take a supplement. Because sometimes we just can't get enough iron through food, especially if you're very, very deficient. So you would take iron supplements. They can be con they can constipate. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, but with iron for the foods, yes. Unfortunately, meats are rich in iron, um, which is fine. You hear about people taking uh, eating liver for iron. I'm always wary of liver, especially the quality of liver with our animals. <laughs> Because um, remember that liver is, is like the detoxing organ and liver is actually very high in cholesterol, very high because the liver produces cholesterol. So I usually don't recommend people to consume liver just because again, the, the quality of our, our meats. Um, so you can get it from just, you know, regular meats, you know, um, a little bit of red meat, it's fine, um, chicken and fish, but for the plant-based options of iron, um, beans, legumes, um, the grains have iron um, fortified into them. And when you're eating the plant-based iron sources, you want to eat it with vitamin C rich food because vitamin C actually helped our body absorb the iron. Also, you want to make sure that you space out iron and calcium. So if any of you are taking calcium or if you're like, hey, I'm going to have my iron pill with milk, just don't do that because iron and calcium, they go head to head. They kind of uh, compete. And unfortunately, iron loses. So you want to space out your iron and calcium consumption by a couple of hours. Um, so yes, that would be um, a way to increase the iron. But again, if it's really low, you might need the supplements. And, and that's totally fine. I was diagnosed with axillary spondylitis. Can this be reversed? I have to do a little bit more research on this particular condition. So whoever asked the question, if you want to email me, um, so it's... Um, let me just go back to the first slide and you guys can get my email. And I really invite you guys to email me anytime, I don't mind. 
Um, so my email is ruhia at gmail.com. So I can look into this a little bit more and get back to you um, about that. A lot of conditions can be reversed, you know, and for inflammation, you guys, it takes time. So you can't be like, okay, you know, I'm, it's going to go away in a couple of days. Sometimes it takes months, year, depending on what's going on. If you have, you know, a toxin metal buildup in the body, it takes time. So, um, so be patient and just, you know, don't get discouraged if some of the stuff doesn't work. Um, also, is milk labeled as, labeled as organic? Okay, so is milk labeled as organic from grass-fed cows or would these be from hormone-injected cows too? Yes, it could be, right? Organic means they don't have certain pesticides, certain, certain hormones um, that are injected. So it's not necessarily hormone-free. And in the UK, you guys actually have really good practices in the UK. I'm always really impressed with the, with the UK. Um, you guys are a lot more stringent in what is in your um, you know, meats and dairy. Um, so you should be, you should be okay. Um, but again, check and see how you feel. So if you cut out, you know, cow's milk, you know, how are you feeling? Um, and ideally, I know this might be controversial to some people, but the thing is, you guys, is we eat a lot of fat. We're getting a lot of fat from a lot of different foods, especially saturated fat. And remember, too much saturated fat can instigate our body to make too much cholesterol. Um, so the recommendation is actually 1% or less. I know some of you are like, what? But yeah, that's the recommendation. Uh, because again, if you want to eat fat, eat good fat. So eat olives, right? Eat nuts, right? You can get good fat, avocados. You don't need high amounts of saturated fat. It's not doing anything positive for you, right? So the fat that they take out of milk is saturated fat, which we don't need that much of. They're not adding more sugar. Do not worry. It's fine. Um, but if you're like, no, I feel weird, then okay, there are other milks you can consume, right? There is, um, you know, almond milk. There is uh, soy milk, you know, again, organic, non-GMO. Um, there's a lot of different milks out there. And again, you guys are welcome to message me because it really depends on what you're looking for, what your condition is for, for me to recommend certain milks. Oat milk, just, just remember you guys, oat milk, you, it's just oats. So there's not really high or any protein in there. And a lot of these milks are being fortified with calcium, which is why a lot of people drink milks is for the calcium. So you're going to get it from that. Um, so that's fine. But if anyone is um, diabetic, I usually don't recommend like oat milk or, or rice milk because it is, um, it will affect your blood sugars for those that are diabetic. Okay. So do you think it's a good idea to get a blood test to gauge where we're at in terms of cortisol? Yeah. So there's something called, and a lot of uh, the functional practitioners can do this. It's called a Dutch test. And this test can look at your cortisol levels to kind of see what it is throughout the day. Because cortisol levels usually in the morning are a little bit high because we're waking up, you know, during the day and these are supposed to go down um, towards the end of the day. But if people are really in a high stress situation, the cortisol levels are usually always high um, or tend to be more on the high side. So um, yeah, so there's that test that can be done. There could be regular tests um, in the conventional realm that can be done to see cortisol, um, but it won't tell you kind of what the pattern is. Um, so that would be something I would look into more in the functional realm. How often did our prophet, peace be upon him, eat meat? I'm not quite sure um, because you, you know, hear about how there would be days where they wouldn't even have like no smoke would be coming out of their homes because they weren't cooking anything, right? So I don't think meat was very common, right? Um, so that would be something, again, I would have to look into, but it wasn't something they ate, like, I wouldn't even imagine on a weekly basis, maybe every, maybe a few times a year, um, if that. Uh, what happens to some of the questions? They disappeared. How much does exercise counteract bad eating choices from past? I love this question because I get this all the time. Can I just eat whatever I want and just exercise it off? I wish because unfortunately, we don't burn as many calories as we think when we exercise, right? We really don't. It's like maybe a couple of hundred calories. If that, that's like, you know, a cookie. So it doesn't really, you know, counteract. We're not going to get rid of some of the, of, of, of the calories on that level. 
as term in terms of like inflammation yes we do see less inflammation it actually can help with our cognitive help like just 20 minute walk and it can be broken up throughout the day um but in terms of like you know uh bad food choices i guess you can say from the past actually in and of itself won't counteract that the best way to counteract that is to eat good to eat well right so then that will get rid of some of those effects into more of a positive um, anti-inflammatory um, mode all right do, do, do. Any there, just a, there were there are just a couple more do you recommend um making your own yogurt Yes, that would be, yes, yes, yes. That would be awesome. And you can even do it in your Instapot. Um, yes, so awesome Any thing to do. Um, actually, I can see those questions. Okay. Oh. Um, so yes, I would recommend making your own yogurt. And again, you know, if some of you that are lactose intolerant or you're wary of, of milk, you don't have to um, have milk for the probiotics. There are some, you can use even other sources of dairy to make yogurt. I'm sure there's tons of great videos online that can do that. Um, any suggestions of good ways to consume saffron? Yeah, saffron, you can even take a little bit of the saffron threads and make like a quote unquote tea with it, right? So you can put turmeric in there, like, like golden milk. I don't know if you guys have heard of golden milk. Golden milk, you take some sort of milk of choice, you add some turmeric, you add some ginger powder, some a cinnamon, you can put a little bit of saffron in there, um, warm it up. You can add a little bit of honey if you want. Um, that's also a prophetic food um prebiotic and that would be a really good way to have it i know this person who asked this question our biryani <laughs> small amounts can have saffron um but yeah so that would be a good way is more to, like drinking it um, as a quote unquote tea is cod liver oil good to take and give kids um the thing with cod liver again because i'm really weary again of the quality of our meats um, I would rather um, micro distilled like fish oil. Um, so that's rich in the omega threes. Like there's like the oh, I'm blanking out on the name of the brands now. Uh, Nordic Naturals has a liquid because um, a lot of the gel caps have gelatin. So we want to we'll be aware of that. Um, so Nordic Naturals there's another one which I am blanking out on the name. Um, but you want to look at the EPA and DHA content. And you want EPA and DHA to be as close to a thousand um, milligrams as you can. Um, so that's hard. That's going to be a little more pricey. The EPA and DHA, those are the, the potent um, omega threes. Um, so that usually we see in just like the regular fish oils. Um, so I would prefer that over the cod liver. And it's you know also you see krill oil, krill oil um, as well. I would rather we have like the fish oil. But you don't have to have fish oil. You know, you can even just have like the fatty fish, you know, the, the walnuts, the, the flax seed to get some of the omega-3s. But yeah, for, you know, for adults and kids, maybe a couple times a week um, should be okay. And I think that was it. Any other questions? Again, you guys are welcome to email me. And again, if any of you are interested in doing like a quote-unquote support group, you know, live sessions, um, where we're in like a smaller group and kind of go through, you know, more on the deeper level of our habits and changing those and some of like the psychology behind our food choices and our exercise and so forth. You know, that's something that we may launch um, later on. So other than that, everyone, Zach Lohair for your time. And I hope this was helpful and the recording hopefully should be up. And if there's anything else you'd like to to finish things off. I just want to thank you, Ruhi, for this really uh, amazing presentation. I think the two presentations together gave people a really good idea about their health, uh, their immunity, and how really um, there are so many things that we can do just in our daily lives to make our health better. So thank you for that. Um, and then uh, again, I just apologize for that uh, drop in uh, Connect in our connection today, but we'll do our best to put the two recordings together and post them uh, hopefully by the end of the day. Uh, please share with friends um, and family that you think will benefit. And um, if, you if you have an interest in more offerings from the Rahma Foundation, you can visit our website, 
uh, www.therahmafoundation.org. We're also on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram now. Um, we have our weekly Friday night halakas. If you missed last night's Friday night halakha, you can see that as well uh, up on the YouTube page. Um, and so please uh, connect to us, whether by mailing list or social media to stay connected. Uh, and our summer camp, of course, launched this morning. If you have uh, girls anywhere in age from basically maybe four to 18, we have summer camps available. They'll be online uh, utilizing Zoom. Um, and so you can register for that as well. So thank you all for attending this session and we look forward to future sessions soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>